Good morning. It's six eleven Monday, and here we are. May God give us the bread of life today. Uh, hope you had a good weekend. I uh, hope it was a blessing. Uh, we are going to be getting into our studies here today, and um, we uh, asked last week for um, some recommendations. We want to do a character study, and uh, I want to say thank you to all those that uh, gave me recommendations and. Um, there were there are basically four, but they were in three categories. So we had um, uh, Priscilla and Aquila, which we will be looking at eventually. Jeremiah, which we'll be looking at eventually. But I liked to go with Noah. Noah was submitted by Gary Shute. And uh, when he said uh, Noah was quarantined, I said, yeah, that would be a really good one to look at. The other thing is I got studying Noah. I realized that we have come full circle now, and I really can only say thank the Lord for this. We come full circle to Genesis 6, which is where we started uh, when we started 611. We started with the, the mind and the workings of the mind, how thoughts come out of the heart, our imaginations out of those thoughts. And guess where that is? That's right in Genesis chapter number 6. So we're going to get right into that in just a moment. So we are indeed going to be looking at Noah, and obviously we're going to be looking at Noah's ark through this process. It's in Genesis chapter 5 through chapter 9 that uh, we'll focus primarily on. And um, here, here's something that I thought was almost sad. Uh, I, I go into Google search, into images, and I put in just the word Noah. Do you think Noah the Bible came up? Mm -mm. actors by the name of Noah came up. All kinds of images of other Noahs other than Noah of the Bible. I don't know how you felt about, feel about that, but I was almost saddened that one of the great characters of the Bible has come missing in Google search. You have to go really in deeper to find him. And yet, we're at the end of an age when we finally look at the prophecies, uh, remember what Matthew says, or what Matthew says of Jesus. He's recording Jesus. He says, as it was in the days of Noah, they were drinking and making merriment. They were being given in marriage. This is an indication of the time of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, the judgment of God. And here we are again. It's not hard to look into our cultures and societies and see a lot of this. And yet, one of the characters, the prophecies dealing with, with the end times is missing from a Google search. Wow. So this motivates me to kind of get into Noah. Let's look at Noah's times. Let's look at what Noah was going through. And let's begin to be speculative. Let's start putting ourselves in Noah's shoes, as it were. And what he was facing. All right. So to do that, we're going to we're going to begin. So here we go. I started a couple of days ago with this, and I started to look at Noah, and I began to meditate on Noah. And as I did, I wrote down these things. Number one, he lived in a godless culture. Number two, he raised a family in an, a, a, an a ungodliness in an ungodly culture. Number three, he's ridiculed for obeying God. Number four, he lo lives through God's wrath on his community. And number five, as I already indicated, and this really came from Gary, not from me, he was quarantined. He was quarantined for a while. And I got thinking about, when you think about the stresses that he must have been under, uh, there is the physical stress and mental and spiritual stress that just comes from just merely trying to live godly and righteously among unrighteous people. That's... That's a given. Remember that only he 
his wife, his three sons, and their three wives were preserved on the ark. That is the indication that those were the only righteous left on the earth. Eight souls. Eight righteous souls left at the time of Noah and the flood. That's a lot of stress. Then he's given a task to build something that he's never seen, do something he's never done, for something he's never prepared for, a flood. Do you realize in the times of Noah, the climate was not as we have it today. And this concept of flooding and, and torrential rains is nowhere recorded until after the time of, of Noah, indicating that the climate was different until the floods came. Then he has, he's a spectacle because he's building something that is absolutely enormous. I do recommend that if you've not been out to uh, Answers in Genesis and the Ark Encounter out in Kentucky, I do encourage you to go there. They're still, they're still developing it. It, it does cost a, a bit of change. But if you are um, definitely a scholar of the Bible, um, this is definitely something to go look at. Uh, and you look at the enormity of this project that he and his sons probably, maybe even his father, we'll talk about that in just a minute, were involved in, uh, and how, how that must have just stood out to the community and to the people. He must have been a laughing stock. He was just trying to be obedient to God. And then <clears throat> when the storms come, you know, and all the preparations and all that happens, and now he has to realize that People he liked, people he did business with, uh, maybe extended family members, they all perished. He is on a physical, mental, spiritual journey that in this quarantine probably has led to an emotional stress. And many joke, and I, I don't think it's too far off, that when he came off the ark, he gets drunk. Now, there are many who believe that there was a change in the, the climate, the change of the chemistry uh, of things. We now have fermentation, would have been quicker, um, and I understand all that. But uh, just think about the enormity of the stress he must have been under to do these things in the name of God and try to maintain his Christian character and be a witness, as it were. And so that's why we're going to look at these. So let's get back to our study. So Noah, when we he's mentioned, uh, it's mentioned in 46 verses, the name Noah, and that's 53 times in the Bible. And remember, in the New Testament, it comes up no, not Noah, and that's probably another half dozen times. So he's a, he's a main character of the Bible. The first time that we see it is in Genesis chapter number 5, verse 29. The last time uh, is Second Peter chapter number 2, verse number 5. Now, I've written down here, right here, he's remembered in the top three. He's remembered in the top three. You say, what are you talking about? Well, the scripture in Ezekiel, remember Ezekiel is dealing with it and also a spiritually low time in the, the nation of Israel. God is bringing judgment on Israel. And what we have is, is this statement by the prophet Ezekiel from God, naming what I call the top three. Notice this. In Ezekiel 14, this comes up two times. Though these three, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness, saith the Lord God. Then verse 20, Though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, as I live, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver, deliver neither son nor daughter. They shall not. They shall but deliver their own souls by their own righteousness, indicating that when God gives this commentary, he says I, that my judgment is coming, and there is, even if it were just Noah, 
it was Daniel and Job. They would have no way of stopping this. If they were to, to pray to me, if they were to, to do superior things in righteousness, that as superior as they are in the Bible, I would not be moved by what they, what they say or what they indicate or what they would do. So that's why I refer to them as the top three. They were righteous. And that's where I want to kind of focus a little bit when we start looking at, at Noah Understand he is a just man or a righteous man. Could I just say, and I will say it over and over again, with Noah, do right. That's Noah. Noah just is a guy that just consistently does what's right. And it leads him to another step, which the Bible refers to him as perfect. And we'll examine that a little bit more. And then it, the next thing, which is really curious to me, is that it says then he's walking with God. We'll talk about that more as we get going. So with that, um, let's talk a little bit about how Noah comes on the scene. So what we have here is his name. And I think that it, if you have, again, the ability through a strong concordance or a computer app to look up names, it gives you a lot of insight into some things. I'm going to give you just a little theory. I think God is so providential that he, he's named you. And that if you'll do a study of your name, it'll give you a glimpse into what God has for your life. Um, I've done that when I've named all my children. All my children have been named according to what we believe God would have us to name them. And then years later now that I look at them, I look at these characteristics and I say, wow, there's some really cool, deep things going on with just the naming of these children. But also, I re also reflect when I go back, I can go through each one of my children and I can tell you where I was in a certain spot of my life based on how I named them. So for instance, my son, Kyle, Kyle Eli, his name basically means the God of the straight and narrow. God of the straight and narrow. It was at a place in my life where I had determined that no matter what, I was going to, to seek the narrow way. I was going to seek God first. And that's what I chose to do. Okay? And I can, you can bounce right up through my children and you can see really basically my fundamental walk as we get down to the end. So... With that, it's no different than Noah. Lamech, his father, names Noah. Look at this. So his name is a transliteration from the Hebrew. It's from the Hebrew language, and it means quiet or rested. Quiet or rested. Now, when we look at the various ways that this the form of this word is used, it comes up the same way, quiet and rested, quiet and rested. And when we go to Genesis chapter 5, verse 28, his father Lamech names him this. And for time's sake, I'm just going to say that you can read it on your own, but Lamech, it appears, murdered a man. He killed a man. He's so troubled by this that he, he believes God's curse is going to be on him. Yet, right after this, God gives him a son. And because I think Lamech either repents or is so sorrowful for what has happened, he names his son Noah as an indication that God is going to give him rest in this. God is going to bring him comfort in this. God is merciful and is giving us Noah through a very hard time. Wow. Guess where the rest of the story goes? God gives us Noah in a very hard time time. So even years prior, remember, you know, I'll stop here and we'll look at the numbers tomorrow. Noah is 600 years old at the time of the flood. 600. 600 years previous to the flood, God could foresee a righteous man coming forth and delivering his people. He uses Lamech. He uses Lamech's Weakness, Lamech's sin. He uses Lamech's mistake 
for Lamech to be used to guide and help Noah to do what is right from that point on. And when we begin to look at this, we begin to understand Noah and his determination to do what's right. Now, I'm going to leave you with one other thought. Noah, none of us, none of us start off fulfilling what God intended us to do. We all start from the opposite. We all start from a position of darkness and come into light. We all start from a place of weakness to come into strength. We all start in a place of unrighteousness to come into righteousness. So I'm going to share with you that I don't think Noah was always a restful spirit. I think he was probably the opposite. And he had to learn how to rest in God. He had to learn how to rest in God. We're going to talk about that as we move forward. Hope you have a great day. Go with God. Let God go with you. And I'm telling you, it is going to be a blessed day. See ya.